Hi everyone. Have you ever thought of the Lord God as being mean? As if he can really make your day miserable. Have you ever thought that God's mad at me today? I think people can say absolutely. Now, you know, we hear the phrase, we have a loving God, and sometimes we have to be reminded He's a loving God because of what we're going through. But it is true, isn't it, that we think, why is He so mean to us? Well, in Nahum, the Old Testament prophet Nahum, dealing with Nineveh, Nahum, Nahum chapter 1 says this. Chapter 1, verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is not ashamed to say it bluntly. He is a jealous and avenging God. And friends, the sooner we accept that, the sooner we grasp that, the better we'll be. As the title of our message is, Would You Believe Our God Has Judgment? Maybe I should say it this way. Would you believe that our God will in fact judge us. Would you believe that our God would in fact judge us? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love and for your mercy. And thank you for your word because your word tells us the truth. And may we pay attention to the truth. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, that phrase, he's a jealous God, has been found in many parts of Scripture. And it is meant deliberate, to be deliberate. The Lord wants to make it clear that there is only one God. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And even though there are so many different religions in the world, Jesus made it clear, I am the way. That's it. Now, don't worry. I know you run into people every day or at least once a year, once every six months. Oh, there's many beliefs out there. I can't believe that God would harm someone who is a sincere person. Well, let's look at Nahum and see what God says. Nahum says, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. If anybody thinks that the Lord just doesn't care or that the Lord only loves and he does love then we are sadly mistaken adversaries or anyone who want to mock God uh, who want to defy him who want to claim there is no God they are the adversary and they can range from somebody who is a simple agnostic to someone who is a mean serial killer who doesn't care about life itself. It can be any person. The, the interesting thing about scripture is the Lord does not try to pacify anybody. Well, you know, it's okay if you feel that way. I remember a pastor once saying that uh, he grew up in a Christian home. And he said, on Sunday morning, he said, 
dad and his dad came into the room to wake him, the boys and him and his brother up for church, and he said, "I don't remember my dad saying." I know you had a rough night last night, and I know you want to sleep in, but if you would consider the possibility of getting out of bed, we're about ready to go. He didn't say that. He said, boys, up. We're going to church. And those boys got up, and they went to church. You see, we have allowed ourselves to believe that our God is soft. After all, he's the most loving God in the history of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus voluntarily came to this earth because of, he loved us. And so anybody who suggests that our God is just a hateful creator is absolutely wrong. He loves intensely, but he's not soft. He makes it very clear, don't cross me. Don't mess with me. I won't tolerate it. You, all you gotta do is watch what happened with Moses and how God calls him and Moses is kind of having a little fit about being leading the people and God kind of gave him a little bit of wiggle room to say a few things back and forth and he finally says enough you're going I've called you that's it and that's the bottom line for everything when God says you're, that's it you go that's it and as he says right here he says in verse number 3 the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. He's slow to anger. Friends, we have the Bible right in front of us. Anybody in America can get a copy of God's Word, either by walking into a church and asking a pastor, Pastor, I see this Bible you got here. Is it okay if I grab it? I don't have one. I need one. I haven't had a chance to go. The pastor might probably go, Sure, just take one. He might. So you can get one free. But most likely it's better to go down to the store and get one for a couple of dollars, five dollars, whatever. Or get an older one that you can just read. You can get them. They're available. The Bible is one of those books that's available so easy to get. And in that book, God reveals what He says is truth. So there is nobody they can argue, well, you know, I just don't understand what God wants. I never understood. It's pretty, you don't read it. It's why you don't understand. You don't look into his word to see what he says. You make excuses. And God is, with, is the Lord. He's gracious. He's patient. I mean, think about this. You have a nation right now in America. It is said that, oh, of the 330 million people, maybe 26% would be called evangelical, maybe a little higher, a little more. And it, for those of you who are not good at math, that means approximately 70 million. That's four times, and maybe more, 70, 80, maybe eight, almost 80 million people. Of those 80 million, those are people who are saying they've asked Jesus to be their Savior. And that's nice. We all hope they have. But at the same time, have you noticed that our world seems to be getting worse and worse? Have you noticed that our country just seems to be battling all these what seem to be ridiculous and no-brainer issues? What happened? Well, part of the problem is we get a lot of people who aren't believers. That's definitely part of the problem. But isn't it possible that Oftentimes the believers are not taking the stand they need to take. Isn't it possible that the believers are just not understanding the word of God like they need to? I've got friends of mine debating some social issues and I'm thinking to myself, Hello? Are you not aware of what scripture says? But they've allowed themselves to let philosophies come in and accept, well, this is okay because this is okay. Well, Joe says it's okay. Or, or, or Dr. Joe at this school, he says it's okay, so it must be okay. 
Is he a Christian? Well, no. Well, he he's a religious man, and he agrees. Whatever. I'm not going to name issues because you can name yourselves. But instead of saying, "Okay, God's word," what do you say? We listen to what these other people are saying, and we go, "Ah, Doctor Joe, must be right," and we buy into it. And so you got believers who are being if I can use the phrase, sucked in by false ideas. Are there good, solid Christians? Absolutely. There are very many solid Christians. And they are in the Word, and they know it is true, but at the same time, those solid Christians are being bombarded by so much trash that they have to really stand firm, sometimes by themselves. Because... For whatever reason, even though the Word of God tells you what it says, tells us what's going on, there's always something that comes along and says, yeah, but maybe not that. All you got to do is go back to the Garden of Eden because God told Adam, not that tree over there, don't touch it. And what did Satan say? Oh, come on. He, do you really believe that? He knows you're going to be, if you pick that other tree, he knows you'll be one. He just completely twisted everything God said and lied to the people, lied to Eve, and she bought it. Both of them bought it. And you know what? Today we're buying it. Too many of us. As he says right here, he says, um, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. He's slow because he loves us and great in power. In other words, he could say, I've had it at any moment. When I was in college years ago, I was attending a church in Emporia, Kansas called Westside Baptist. And the pastor, Dean Planner, is still preaching the word. I talk to him once in a while. Very good man. Wonderful man of God. His wife's wonderful too. And it was in those days, many years ago, that we were really thinking that the end was coming because of just certain things that were going on in terms of world events. We thought it was about ready to happen. We actually had an evangelist come in and said, quote, some guy who was like a predictor and said, the end will come in 1981. And I'm like, wow. Well, it didn't come in 1981. You can't, we don't know. My, my point is, is the mess of the world makes it clear that God said, God's going to get to the point where he said, I've had it. He's going to get to the point where he says, you know what? You haven't seen my power yet. And either he'll deliver power that will really clobber us all and make us really want to humble ourselves for God, which could happen. Or it could be power where he says, you know what? I'm calling my saints home. But God says, I've got the power because I'm almighty. In this other verse, we see it says, the Lord is full of anger and the Lord will, see, in great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. There's a lot of people out there who want to twist scripture, who want to say, I'm a believer in God, but I think this is right and this is wrong. Yeah, you got people, you turn on different networks or you read something, oh, I'm a believer, but I just think this is this is right and this is wrong. And I don't see why this is right. This is they I mean they're, they're, the reasons the reasoning is convoluted. And, and you have to think to yourself, what's wrong? And as it says right here, it says, uh, the Lord by no means clearly guilty. The ones who are knowing that what they're doing is wrong, boy, they're going to get whacked. And the ones who are being deceived, they're going to have a wake-up call. He's not going to clear anybody who's guilty. In other words, you can't stand before God and say, Well, Lord, yes, I shouldn't have supported this cause or this cause because after all, I, I understand. I, I support it because of this. You understand. God said, No, I don't. Or uh, I said that wrong. I meant to say, Lord, I supported this cause. I still believe I was right. I know you don't agree with me, but I believe I was right. And God says, No, you weren't. You were wrong. If you support something that's against Scripture and you say to, your, to God, I am certain I'm right, and God says you're wrong, guess who's wrong? You are wrong. 
whatever that uh, movement is you're supporting, if it's contrary to scripture, and you're behind that movement and all in on it, you're guilty. If you're committed to doing things that are wrong, whatever it might be, you're guilty. It's kind of like uh, the salesman who um, goes out and brings a car out and uh, t puts out, I told you the story about businesses advertising you can get a $50 uh, pair of, uh, what do they call them, um, uh, boots for $10. Come and get them. And you get there and they're only still all sold out. Why? Because there's only one available. Now the courts have ruled, well, that's okay because it's invitation to deal. But would God approve? I don't know. I'm going to suggest maybe not. And that person who's a store owner who professes Christ will walk up to God and say, well, Lord, that's just business. And you know that. It's just the way business works. Is God going to say, oh, of course, I don't blame you. Or is God, God going to say, no, guilty. When we do stuff as believers that is very clearly wrong in Scripture, no matter whether we have the support of a local minister, no matter if all our Christian friends agree with us, no matter what we say is okay, if the Lord God in His Word says no, it's no. And He will, when we meet Him, say, You're wrong. You're guilty of doing wrong. There is not one person who is going to get away with stuff that you can't do. There's a Bible verse also that talks about that which is hidden will be revealed. Oh boy, I can tell you there's going to be some stuff that's going to be revealed about me that's going to cause everybody to run the other way and say, Get away! Well, guess what? I think we all have that situation. Because we are all fallen people. And to think, if anybody thinks, Well, you know what? I memorized 15 scriptures today. I was in that word 13 hours. I'm glad you're in the word. And I'm glad you've been memorizing scriptures. But don't think you're better than somebody else. Don't do that. And don't put somebody else down because they're not in church every other day or every other minute. And I'm not faulting people who are in church all the time. I was uh, listening to Kevin McCarthy, a former Speaker of the House, talked about this one of his uh, congressmen being in church every day. Fine. If you want to go to church every day, if the church door is open, you can pray. Praise God. But don't look down on somebody who's not following your footsteps. Now, I'm not saying that, let's say you've got a friend who doesn't go to church at all. I'm not saying you should condone that. I'm just saying if they're not going to church and they need to be in church, it's okay to say, hey man, I'm praying for you. You want to come with me to church? That's fine. To encourage them to come. But don't go, you don't go to church? Why not? I do. No. Guilty. Don't judge. Love. Understand. Invite them in. God and our, our actions, there's, there, is, there are going to be so many people who are believers who are going to come before the Lord and they're going to be shocked by God saying, you're guilty of this. You did this wrong. You shouldn't have done that. They're going to be stunned. Maybe because they never heard it in church before or maybe because they just thought, well, God doesn't really care. I've told you this story many times. I'll tell it again. President Reagan, who I really thought was a great president, was being was debating Walter Mondale in 84, I think it was the 84 election. And he's talking about going to church. And Reagan didn't go to church, partly because his wife was scared of the, because he had the assassination at the time. And he comes out and says, but I don't go, and he gave her his reason. And he, said, and he says, I think God understands. And I love that answer. Everybody loved the answer. But years later, I realized, Yes, Mr. President, you're right. God understands. But it doesn't change the fact, Mr. President. You should have gone. You did wrong. And I'm sure when the Lord met him, probably told him a lot of good things he did, but he said, Ron, you did this wrong. And friends, we're going to find out from God what we've done that we shouldn't have done. The Bible says right here, His way 
is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. His way are in the whirlwind and the storm. God works in ways that we are always astonished by. You know, I, I'm i sure you had that one time, got that check in the mail that you didn't expect. Or maybe you had that knock on the door and you had that great gift of clothes. I, we had that happen a few years ago. I came up to the door and there's some clothes there for me. I walked into a Sunday school class saw a gift card for me. I went to the men's store and bought some clothes. People, God works through people to bless us like that. There's some amazing things that happen in our lives. We get on the freeway and we drive, and you've driven like this before, where you drive along and somebody comes across it, and man, they scare the day. But they keep on going, and all you can say is, God, thank you that I'm able to continue to drive. The Lord blesses us so often. And the fact is, I'm just going to tell you, I don't deserve it. I know I deserve help. Because I'm a sinner. But God saved my soul because he loved me. And he saved your soul too. If you're listening and you're a believer, he saved your soul because he loves you. And we got to remember that. that. Even though we think we're doing something pretty good, it's only God. It's, the reason, it's God the reason why we're doing so good. It says right here, His way is in the whirlwind and the storm. We just don't understand it. When it takes place, how it took place whenever we have that get that promotion I didn't expect a promotion no because God was working or I and you know I get kind of caught up and well maybe I is it because of this the Lord did what he did because he is the one stirring things up he is the one moving things around he is the one opening up the doors it's the Lord is doing that and he is in that whole experience if we are following him he is really smack in the middle of it all and it's beautiful to watch he says right here he rebukes the sea and makes it dry he dries up all the rivers now picture that river dried up sea dried up most people don't like a scene like that because that usually indicates drought now back a couple three or four years ago I was looking at a news article online and it talked about a drought in New York State well they had been without water for so long that a town reemerged a town that was from like the 1800s or something like that. And what happened? Well, the town got hit by a flood. And wiped it out. But because of the lack of rain, that town was uncovered. You see, friends, the Lord takes care of situations like that. Why would God uncover a town? Maybe to remind us of how powerful he really is and how much everything is in his hands. We, too often times, I got a river nearby. Hey, I got a river here. I'm good. I was talking to some students today about how um, certain older cultures, how they started, when a civilization was started. Where do you find most civilizations of old? Well, most of them are found near a river. Or body of water. Why? And I asked them why. And the student put her hand up. Transportation and uh, also agriculture. Spot on. Trade. People want to get back and forth. They want to trade. They want to have agriculture. And what happens is you got these little communities. They depend on it. They bring their water in. But what happens? Maybe just maybe they get a little bit caught up with their own. Look at what we've accomplished. And God says, well, Let's see what happens when a drought happens. And then we find ourselves humble before God. So he takes care of all that stuff, doesn't he? And then we see right here. Um, the mountains quake. Okay. 
He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. What a description of the power of Almighty God. And that is what this does. It lets us all know that God is Almighty. And it's interesting. In this context, the focus is on God saying, I am a jealous God. I do not like anything. I will not accept anything but me being worshipped. The son of the creator. I am the one. I'm the creator. There's no one else. And those of you who want to play around with that, well, I'm going to show you who is almighty and who is not. I am almighty. They're not. And God's making it very clear in the context. I will do what I need to do to prove I am who I am. And friends, we need to remember that. As we were saying here, he says, the first down here, he goes, who can stand before the his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in a day of trouble, he knows who take refuge in him. The Lord is good. Despite the fact that he is going to judge, that despite the fact he can bring almighty heaven down on us, despite the fact he can make so many lives miserable, the Lord is good. And why? Because it says right here, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He's the one we turn to when we're going through difficult times. He's the one. And then it says, he knows those who take refuge in him. He knows the ones who are following him. He knows the ones who are seeking him only. He knows the ones that are following him. And may I ask you, are you following him? If not, maybe it's time. The Lord is good. God is a jealous God. And the fact is, he doesn't he doesn't want anybody else worship but him. You worship him alone because he's a jealous God. And the Lord is good. The only way to find out is to say, Jesus, please, I ask you to come into my heart to be my Savior. May you do that today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and for your mercy. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you, and have a good day.